Welcome, guys, to another edition of Alternative Sport, brought to you by your one and only Daniel Filui. Um, fortunately, I don't have my co-host Dre um, or the guys Matt with me today, but I do have a special guest with me. Um, he goes by the name of Mr. Jamie Roots. How are you, uh, Daniel? I'm great. It's good being with you. Oh, it's a pleasure, pleasure being with you. So, Jamie, tell a lot of people, uh, tell the folks at home exactly who you are, um, and then we can sort of go into that, really. Well, it's kind of crazy. You call, you're calling it alternative sport, right? Yeah. In, in, uh, in America, the NFL is a pretty big deal. So I serve as the president of the Houston Texans. I've been here for 20 years, um, was part of a group of five or six people that began the startup of the team. Mm. We spent 30 months. We played our first season in 2002, and, and here we are uh, in 2021. And uh, it's been a great ride. You know, the best is yet to come. We we feel like this team is capable of winning a championship, particularly with uh, with number four at the helm. <laughs> so I know you're a big fan. So that's I'm a massive at. fan of Deshaun Watson. Absolute massive fan of Deshaun Watson. Uh, so let's actually go into that, because I think for a lot of people, they don't actually know the journey. Obviously, the T- T- Houston Texans are one of the newer teams of the NFL, haven't been actually for a round. So how did you actually get into starting a new franchise in, NH- in, in, a, uh, in the National Football League and uh, going from there? Well, the, uh, you know, there are 32 clubs in the National Football League. We balanced everything out. It was unbalanced. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that made for an, an even number, and it stayed there. Um, Bob McNair, uh, you know, offered $750 million for the franchise mm-hmm. rights. And so with that, I think we got two footballs, a jersey, and the, uh, the right to be able to pay hundreds of millions of dollars to players. So, uh, so <laughs> but it, it's a, I mean, it is an elite club. It is a, uh, a great uh, business run well by our, our commissioner. Um, and uh, so we took 30 months. We got the team rolling. We've sold out every game we've ever played, which is really different for Houston. Houston didn't have that kind of history mm-hmm. uh, back with the Houston Oilers. And so proud of what we've built in terms of our, our fan base and our business base. And, and you know, in, in the NFL, just like in the premiership, it's, it's up and down. You know, you win and you lose. And and uh, but but the one thing that's remained constant is the relationship that we have with our fans. Oh, fantastic. And um, so obviously you started in, you got into the Houston Texans. You've been there now for for you've sort of worked your way through the organization. I guess what's been the, the greatest highlight for you so far being at Houston Texans organization? Oh, gosh, um, <laughs> I, I think it would just just have to be the relationship that we've built with this community in our uh, our fans are amazing. Um, we have 30. 5,000 fans tailgating mm-hmm. two and a half hours prior to kickoff. Um, they're, they're with us uh, win uh, and lose. And we try to win more often than we lose. And uh, they're just special people. It's really a, an iconic uh, community asset that has been developed here. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. And um, so you've moved in now. You've seen part of the, this, you know, sort of, it's, it's a tough conference that you're in, or division, I should say, that you're in with the Colts who've done historically done well with Peyton Manning, and then you've had Andrew Locke, you had the Jags who've not done so well, and the Titans have been sort of up and down in, in their sort of, I guess, in their history, really. Um, I guess, where, where in, where do you see in terms of the competition and in terms of sort of going against it? How, how's that battle been in terms of being in the, in that division that, you know, going facing up against these sort of historically great quarterbacks, you know, good teams. And, you know, how's that been really for you as well, a fan? I, I'd have to say you, you take all 32 teams okay. on any given Sunday. And that's a saying that you hear often on any given Sunday, any team can beat any other team because each team's got the same resources as it relates to players. You got the same uh, amount of money to be able to spend on players, which is different than other sports leagues across the, the planet. So the parity is just remarkable. And uh, when you compare, uh, you know, football, the National Football League to baseball, one Sunday is like a month in baseball, <laughs> right? It's all compressed into three hours. So it's just this incredibly intense experience every week. You never know who's going to come out on top. Uh, people like to speculate that this team or that team is not very good. And then they wind up beating the best team in the league. So the unpredictable nature of it is, is remarkable. It, it really takes great leadership. It, it takes good decisions relative to personnel. You got to manage the cap well, and you got to have a team that, uh, that has a, a, you know, really tight locker room. You got to have guys that are willing to go out there and battle for each other every week, uh, not knowing what is going to happen. But if you don't believe in yourself, you have no shot. No, I get that. that that's good. And, 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 um, 
In terms of, so see, let's talk about Deshaun Watson, obviously, because, you know, he is the number four over there. He is the quarterback, probably one of my favorite players in the league. You know, I'm going to ask you this. What what made the organization draft Deshaun? Because, you know, you had Chicago. They went up to get Mitch Trubisky. You then had Patrick Mahomes as well. What made you guys go for Deshaun? Why did you decide that he was your franchise QB? Well, it's a gut feeling. I mean, you look at all the stats and you evaluate uh, all the players that you might have an opportunity to select, but at the end of the day, it's a human business and you never, you, you can project people to the next level, but you're not really sure. But Deshaun was very special. Uh, I, I went to Clemson University. Okay, he went so, to Clemson okay. University, so I followed him closely. He had a tremendous reputation being a high character player, somebody who really cared deeply about the game. One of the tricks of the trade, I think in any sport is trying to separate out what 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 is this person's uh, football character or soccer character or whatever sport it is. Are they doing this because they love the game or mm. do they love everything that comes along with it? So when they get a big paycheck, <laughs> you might've seen their best, uh, best football or soccer or whatever. And so it really, it was clear that D- Deshaun had a very strong football character. It, football matters to him. His teammates really matter to him. The community matters to him. And so special guy, you're never hundred percent sure but he's been everything that we thought he would be and then some. Oh, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. Because I know that he loves football. He talks about football a lot. And I know Dabo called him sort of the Michael Jordan of, of football. So I guess, you know, if you don't know, because you guys have just hired your general manager at the moment right now, you're looking for your for your head coach right now. What, you know, forget sort of the names thrown out there. I want to know from your point of view, what do you what do you personally look for in a, in a head coach? What What makes you, you know, sit down with this person and say, yes, this person is right for our organization? Yeah, well, it's about character and it's about integrity. But above all else, you're trying to find a leader of men, someone that the guys will follow and will respect. It's a very difficult locker room, probably similar to uh, in the premiership. You know, that yeah. uh, th- these guys have, have egos. These guys have desires. And somebody's got to be there to bring everything together. Somebody mm-hmm. that all the players believe in that uh, has their best interests at heart. It's a very difficult job. It's like being the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. It's not all about X's and O's. There's a tremendous amount of demands on, um, on an NFL head coach. And, and uh, it's a rare person that can navigate it well, in addition to the, the, the work that's required. Mm-hmm. I mean, these guys work their tails off. They sleep in their offices. They're game planning all hours of the day and of the night. And, uh, it, and it just doesn't end. And so it really does take somebody very special with a unique character, unique integrity, above all else, a great leader that, uh, that communicates well and that the players buy into the vision. All right, that's good. Maybe I could be a, one of those uh, head coaches. I've got to know my X's and O's is pretty well. But hey, yeah. I know, I know for sure I couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so well, let's go to sort of NFL. Now it's growing really, really rapidly within within the UK. We've got a massive fan base, and um, I know for, you know from this interview, I'm pretty sure we're going to you know develop some more Houston Texan fans for sure. I'm definitely going to. Well, Danny, be- you know we were there last year. We played the yeah. Jaguars, and I got yeah, I was see- there. I, I saw the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw great. the game. So I feel like I'm an unofficial ambassador for the Houston Texans for London. We'll talk about that after. So, um, but, you know, we talked about NFL maybe building a franchise in, in the in the UK, in London. Obviously, you being one of the presidents of the teams, do you see that as a, you know, viable, realistically speaking, from a, just a logistics operations point of view? And if so, would you want to see that? See, that's the thing is you, you would have great ownership there. It's a mm-hmm. wonderful market. It's got everything that you would want to have in, in, a, in an NFL market. You know, the challenge is the logistics because uh, we talked earlier about the parity that exists in the National mm-hmm. Football League. And if one team, I mean, and there's such a fine line between winning and losing. So if you put a team consistently at a disadvantage like that, it's going to be hard for them to be competitive. I know the the league continues to look at it and try to, see if we can make that happen after mm-hmm. having been over there. I mean, there, no question about the fan support, no yeah. question about the financial wherewithal of the companies and the broadcasting side and everything that you could want. It's just really comes down to that logistical component. Yeah, no, because I know from, from a fact, fact, if you had a team in, in the UK, because obviously with the games that you get 80,000 plus fans, I think there is an appetite there for sure when it comes to actually growing NFL in the UK and obviously you know you've got NFL in Germany as well um 
how much scouting do you guys actually do within the UK? Because obviously, with, if you you talk about soccer, um, you know, football over here for us UK fans, yeah. um, you know, we, you know, the teams do a lot of scouting internationally, try and find the great players. You know, I've seen, I know you've got the UK NFL Academy, but how much actual scouting from the Houston organization do you guys do for international players and try and get them on into the game? Yeah, well, the, all of that international player development is handled by the league office. Okay. From time to time, teams are presented with opportunities to bring players on in an internship capacity, maybe even as a uh, you know full, full-fetched player for the team. But those efforts to scout those players and to develop those players are all done centrally by the by the league office. Oh, so individual teams can't really you know sort of go and say, "Look, I really like this guy. I think he could be a great running back or anything like that." No, no. Oh, oh that's a bit of a shame then. <laughs> I thought I'm not you sure could. Did, but but there's so many players here in the United States. We don't have enough hours in the day to even look at them. I mean, I was going to probably just angle and just say, you know what, I could help you. <laughs> you scout some players in the UK for you. Um, so look, with with what, obviously you've been in the NFL, you've been in the organizations, but what really started your love for football? You know, it's, uh, it's probably the same as soccer is um, throughout the world. I mean, from the time I was born, I had a football in my hand. Every kid plays football growing up in the backyard. I mean, we would play hours and hours and hours. And then you had the opportunity to watch the game on TV and uh, played as a youth. Uh, and so I fell in love with the game uh, early on. It's such, it's just a, a great sport, particularly as a spectator. Uh, now playing the sport, is pretty rough, right? You got to, you got to, you know, kind of like yeah. yeah. So, but I started um, in maybe first or second grade playing soccer. So I went to school at Clemson. I played at Clemson. Mm-hmm. I started the Columbus crew in major league soccer. I coached in, at Indiana university before transitioning over to American football, but it wasn't a hard transition because the game had been part of my life for my entire life. Yeah. Um, you're always learning it. You're always developing. The game's always changing, but, uh, but it's always been a passion of mine. No, I get that. That's, that's, uh, that's amazing. And you mentioned Clemson, I, I, you know, so I saw the re- movie recently safety about Clemson. I went to Purdue university. So I obviously I know the history in terms of sort of uh, college football for me, what makes Clemson such a great college program in terms of college football program, you had to Sean, you had Dabo, you've had great players and great success from Clemson. What makes it for your personal view, uh, such a yeah, great I- college program? Well, what you see mainly is Dabo, right? And he, he is the, the secret ingredient. But they've got two other components, two other people, leaders there at that university. Jim Clements, who's the president of yeah. the university, is a tremendous advocate for, uh, for collegiate athletics. And Dan Radakovich is their athletic director. I think that the, the marriage of those three together has allowed this uh, program to really become what everybody always wanted it to be. All right. So, yeah, so it is such a great program and, you know, they, so much success from, from Clemson. I think, uh, you know, I've got, uh, is it Trevor Lawrence is now coming out of Clemson as well, potentially as well. So, we, you know, great quarterbacks, great players are coming in. Um, so we're going to move towards your book. Obviously you being a president, you've been a successful business, you know, executive, you've obviously you run the Houston Texans, which is a great organization, a great franchise. You've now written a book about the winning game plan. Um, and for those who haven't seen it or read it, sorry, um, it's been it's a great read. It's actually it helps you in terms of motivations, in terms of going into into the business, in terms of even if you're not business savvy, it just helps you motivate you in terms of your life and what to do in terms of your goals. So, Jamie, what what made you actually write the book? You know, what what inspired you? Well, I, I I've always thought that I would write a book at some point in time, mm-hmm. and I've pretty much been a failed writer twelve or fourteen times. I would sit down and do an outline. But what made me write it now is I feel like I'm at a point that I have a very clear perspective on how we built a business Mm -hmm. that is completely separate and distinct from performance on the field. We win, we lose, but the business continues to have this meteoric rise. So how how did that happen? I wanted to explain that story to people so that they could learn from it. Also my publisher, uh, Melanie Johnson, really convinced me that I had what it took to write a book. She had a look at some of my presentations, speeches that I'd done in the past. Mm-hmm. And she was like, you, the challenge here is going to be netting it down. You know, you, you don't have to write more. <laughs> you just have to squeeze this down so that it is about 150 pages and people can digest it. So I, I really did want to help people at the end of the book. I, I mentioned that I saw this as a, 
a gift to the world in hopes that it could help people's lives, help their mm -hmm. businesses be more successful. And I do think it's a very practical um, guide to leading any organization. No, yeah, it's. I mean, it's an international bestseller for a reason. Uh, for, for, for so, so obviously, it does have some handy, handy tips. How? First of all, I guess two questions and two from there. You know, how long did it take you to, you know, come up with the formula to write this book? And and then and the second layer in terms of that, you know, is there going to be a potential second book coming out, maybe as a follow up to this? Yes. Yeah, so um, the book was really thirty five years in the making. Okay. Because I've always been a student of leadership, both in terms of the people that I've worked with, people that have allowed me to, you know, be mentored by them, a lot of the reading that I've done, but it took from start to finish about seven months to write the book and get it into a format that it was ready uh, to be pu published. In terms of a, uh, of a sequel to it, I could see that happening because I do mm -hmm. believe, as you said, the principles in this book are not just applicable to business. They're applicable to your family life. Uh, actually, as we don't have done the research on who's buying it, I, I really intended for 30 to 40 year old middle managers to give oh. this, give them the opportunity to take a leap in their career. But the, it's most popular among 18 to 24 year olds. So folks that are just uh, in college, starting their careers, seeing this as a way for them to, you know, get their career on track. Oh, that's that's I mean, yeah, I think you know what it is. I think there's been a shift in if I, in sort of the generation of see a lot of think younger generations in past times of you know try to enjoy their life, enjoy the early 20s. And I think you start to see now more younger younger people be a bit more savvy, be a bit more want to go into business. I think you know, there's a stat sort of like sort of 50 percent of people would love to have their own businesses. So I, I can see why there has been a lot of young people going for your book, because I think there has been a shift from a cultural point of view to go out there, make your own and, and sort of be inspired by people out there. Yeah, that's been that's been gratifying. And I actually begin at the end of this week at uh, the University of Houston as an adjunct professor in leadership. So, um, okay. you know, I, I'm just I, I've I feel like I've been beneficial to the hundreds of people that work here, mm -hmm. but I'd like to expand that uh, impact, the ability mm. to make people better at what they do. Do you think you ever would maybe come over and do a special lecture in the UK as well then? Of course, you pay all my expenses. I'm on the next flight. <laughs> <laughs> more like you need to pay my expenses to come to Houston. More like, well, um, so yeah, in terms of, you talked about leadership and leadership is an important thing in this book. It helps, and there's a lot of motivation, motivational stories in the book to help people. Before we go into the book a little bit more on that, but from your personal view, if you were to say, you know, growing up or even now, is there a particular leader that inspires you to, to be better or motivates you to be better is, you know, even if it's not now, maybe a pastime person, um, yeah. you know, like a Muhammad Ali, who, who for you inspires you the most? Well, there, there were people along the way that have, have inspired me and taught me and developed me and really helped me to get to where I am. One mm -hmm. is Bob McNair, who is the founder of the Houston Texans. And he is who I dedicated the book to. Okay. Uh, prior to that was Lamar Hunt, who was the founder of the American Football League and was my boss when I was in Columbus, Ohio, starting the uh, Columbus crew. And mm. I guess maybe if I had to put three out there, uh, Jerry Yeagley was the head men's soccer coach at Indiana University. Mm -hmm. All three of these guys were high, high character, very successful at what they did, but at the same time, extremely humble. And uh, they worked hard to support the organization, put everybody's needs in front of their own. And, uh, you know, in that they were very similar, but they were very different people. Um, those those were three people that really um, wanted me to be a better person. Yeah. All right, that's good. So how much, how, you know, because obviously, Bob, you know, the great Bob McNair, unfortunately, he's passed, but how much, of, how much did he influence you? How much did he actually, you know, help you to where you are right now? You know, Lamar Hunt, when I was in Columbus, I, I you know, I was there for five years. Mm. I would, I would, that was an MBA in sports management. I mean, he, he had been around the track so many times. I mean, he could just do it in his sleep. And I learned so much just by working with him and observing him when, uh, and I have an MBA from Indiana, but with Bob, it was really an MBA 2.0, mm -hmm. practical hands-on. Here's how you run a business. He had started a, a trucking company, trucking company went bankrupt. Okay. And then he restarted his life and 
uh, started a company called Cogen that he sold for a billion dollars to Enron just prior to Enron's uh, de demise. And he took those proceeds and, and bought the Houston Texans. So Bob, Bob knew how to run a business inside and out. And so the best way for me, I'm a visual learner. I, I can't, I, I don't want somebody to sit and lecture me. I want to watch what he's doing, how he does it and try to replicate those types of principles. And, and so, uh, yeah, but that would, Bob had a tremendous, any, maybe even more so than my business acumen was what he taught me as a human. Uh, he's so kind, he was so kind, so philanthropic, so concerned about the needs of others, a great family man. All those things really um, uh, resonate, resonated well with me. All right. And uh, I guess then for me going forward, obviously to the people who are gonna listen who wanna read your book, if there was one story you could pick, get them to pick out from the book, you know, just one lesson, one life lesson, one story. What, what, what would that be? Without going into too much detail, because I want them to sort of read the book. But without yeah. going into too much detail, what, 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 what one life lesson or or story would you want people to pick out from your book? Well, I'll tell you that my favorite chapter is the last chapter, chapter okay. seven, because number one, I started feeling pretty good about what I was doing. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't write the introduction and I didn't write the conclusion. I wrote everything in the middle and then I did the introduction. I did the conclusion. I was like, you know what? This is going pretty good. I'm feeling confident. Um, so things just really started to flow. And uh, there, there are three key lessons in that uh, chapter. And I won't give you all three, but I'll give you one that is really the theme for my life. It was uh, in 1987, I was on a bus headed to play uh, San Diego State in the national championship of <laughs> soccer when I was with Clemson. I was sitting next to my best friend, Paul Rutenis. And uh, it was a championship game. If we win, we realize all of our dreams. If we lose, we have nothing. And so <laughs> uh, Paul turned to me and said the most comforting thing that he could. He said, we got to play the game anyway, Jamie. We might as well win it. And at that moment, I made a commitment to myself that in everything that I do, mm -hmm. I'm not playing to play. I'm not playing for second place. I'm playing to win. And we did win. And it's just an attitude in your life. Once you, you may not always win, but until you make the decision that I'm playing to win, you're probably going to lose more often than you're going to yeah. win. If you're playing to win, you're going to win more often than you lose. I love that. I love that. I love that mindset. Completely love that mindset. So we're going to go back to football and I'm going to ask you some tricky questions, you know, put you a little bit on the spot with regards to stuff. Obviously you mentioned that you want to win a, you know, the Super Bowl. It's the end goals. The, it's the, it's the pinnacle of the NFL. What do you think stopping or has stopped Houston in the past? Obviously I know you've come across the Brady's and, and the Mannings of this world, but what do you think now it's you guys are lacking it from a personnel wise or what is it that you think could could elevate you guys to win that chip well i tell you it's just so difficult to win a championship mm. in the national mm. football league my gosh we were in i don't know detroit and then cleveland and i see these you know uh nfl champion from 1952 you know it's been like 70 years since they won a championship and we've only been around for 20 years so you can't get that frustrated mm. because the goal you only one team ends this season happy. 31 others end in a dumpster fire. And so, and then you have a chance to go and do it again. And we are one year removed from being three quarters away from the AFC championship yeah. at home. I mean, yes, yeah, like getting to the very end of the promised land and then being told it's time to go home. So the, the number one First thing you have to do in a football team is you gotta you gotta have a great quarterback. We got a great quarterback. Then you gotta start looking at the lines. Then you have to start looking at the cornerbacks and then your weapons on offense. And, and each year there's this shuffling of the roster that goes on. And you know, there are personnel people a lot smarter than me that are trying to slot in the right guys, not only from a talent perspective, but have the right football character, you know, mm -hmm. and the right team chemistry in order to win a championship. It's, it is the greatest reality TV show ever made. Think about it. If you've ever watched like the, the, uh, the uh, oh, what's it called? That Survivor or The yeah. Bachelorette or The Bachelor. Okay, so in The Bachelor uh, or The Bachelorette, the, when Steve doesn't get a rose, Steve gets into a 
limo and you never see him again. <laughs> yeah. And if Bill gets married to Susie, they're not back next season. Mm. You know, if you don't get a rose and, and get invited to the playoffs, six months later, you're going to be back at it again. Everybody gets to start over at zero. The greatest reality TV show ever made is the National Football League. <laughs> I love that. So obviously you've been in, you've been president uh, for some time. You've, you know, you've basically you effectively, you know, you're the second man after the owners, um, the Mayfair family. Do you ever get tempted to maybe want to get involved in, in the draft selection? Because I always feel like that draft is, draft day is massive. It's big. It's fun. Do you ever see like, well, guys, maybe you should go for this guy or, you know, no, I'm going to, you know, veto you. I definitely want to get, like, for example, I definitely want Deshaun. Is there any, you know, temptation from your end to, to get involved in that? I've, I've only voiced a couple of times and they were because they were my Clemson guys, uh -huh. uh, Hopkins and, and Deshaun, those two guys. I just, you know, you kind of whisper in people's ear, make sure that they're <laughs> having a look. But at the end of the day, the personnel guys, that's what they do. They don't tell me how to make money and I don't tell them how to build a football team. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, but yeah, no, because I think it's, it's as you said, I mentioned before, it's one of the hardest things, you know, in terms of, you know, you look at the Patriots, for example, great, as they will say, a sports dynasty, but they're very, they're an outlier. When you look at actual individual teams, it's very hard to get into the Super Bowl and then even win it after. You look at San Francisco just last year winning the Super Bowl and now they've sort of struggled. Um, so it has, it is a, it is a difficult process i would say in that regard but you know i think with the houston texans i think you guys have been very close in the past i think you now have a franchise quarterback in the sean watson um and i think that is very is a key once you have that it, it, it sort of everything falls into place but obviously with covid um depending on what happens with, with the covid situation do you guys have any plans to play in london this year or next year or or in, in sort of in, in, in anytime soon well, I know the National Football League will definitely be back, assuming the COVID restrictions are lifted over in London. We were disappointed that we weren't able to do the game this year. I, I wouldn't anticipate that the Texans will be back in that game for some time. Uh, we may go back to Mexico City. We had a we had a good experience in both places, but the league the league is really the one that makes those decisions on on who's going to go where. And you know, the Jacksonville Jaguars, as you know, yeah. they have. A, position over there in London every year, but all the rest of the teams will just be cycling through. So is it is it by random that you get the games or is it, can you guys request to play an, a game abroad, for example? Usually you're, you are uh, notified about it and you have an opportunity to have a conversation with the league. If you're in the middle of a transition, like mm. if you're moving stadiums, moving markets, like we've had LA, um, we've had the, the, the Raiders, the Rams, when, when you're when you're in transition, the league has the right to kind of make you play in international games because you're mm -hmm. already in transition. Everybody else, it's a it's a conversation. Also, if you host the Super Bowl, the league has the right to uh, put you into an international game really? when your home game is being replaced uh, over a certain uh, period of time. OK, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Um so obviously, since you've been a, a president of Houston, Texas, you've you've seen the ups, you've seen the downs, you've seen the highs, you've seen the lows. Which team was probably giving you the most lows so far in terms of facing when you know you got you got them on the schedule and you're like, really wish we didn't have to play them. Yeah, boy, uh, that's a great that's a great question. To begin with, it was the Colts. Okay. When they, when they had Peyton Manning, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we just we could not get get those guys. I mean, it took us years particularly going up there mm. trying to play. It's such a tough place to play. I, I, I'll just, I mean, all the teams are difficult. There's, um, you know, anytime you walk into a game and you think it's going to be a cakewalk, you wind up getting punched in the mouth and uh, mm. you walk away with a, with an L rather than a W. <laughs> so I, 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 they're all, they're all difficult. Well, is there any, is there any particular stadium that you like to, to visit? Cause obviously, you know, we've got the new stadium with Las Vegas. We've got the Rams now and, and the Chargers. any particular stadium that you, that you look like, I really do like this stadium. Yeah. I, I love going to Lambeau field. It's, it's okay. like the home of, of the NFL. That's, I mean, it's just so historic and they have a beautiful hall of fame there. There's just such great history with the frozen tundra and uh, <laughs> even if it's, even if it's cold, you get out of the plane and it's zero, 
zero degrees Fahrenheit. Mm. Um, and uh, you're just like, this is football weather. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're going to see that now, actually, you, you know, in terms of that. I think Lambo has been historically really, really, really tough to play in January in terms of playoffs because of how cold it is. And you guys obviously, you know, down in Texas, it was always really warm. <laughs> so it's yeah. always been, always, uh, you well, guys. It's, like, it's like our version, it's like our version of Wembley. Mm, mm, no, that's good. Yeah, that is actually very true, to be fair. <laughs> um, so I guess, you know, in terms of from your, your history at NFL, what's been your, your biggest pride or biggest sort of success that you feel or happiness or joy from being associated with the NFL? You know, I, I think what's best about, and particularly here at the Houston Texans, it's the team mm -hmm. that we've put together. The uh, individuals, the teammates, I call them, that I get a chance to work with every day. And there's, there are many stories in the book that I wrote, uh, The Winning Game Plan, right, uh, that, uh, uh, that celebrates the, what I call the whatever it takes attitude, mm -hmm. that these folks care so deeply. It doesn't matter what we're trying to get accomplished. They don't ask, can we or can't we? They ask, what's it going to take? And they go about just making that happen. They're such special people. We've got great ownership. I talked earlier about the fans that we've put together. Um, it's just really been a, a beautiful experience. And I do believe we've created created something of lasting value here in Houston. That's good. Yeah. Now, I think you guys have, you know, it's not easy to, first of all, start up a franchise. You've seen so many franchises move and, you know, go from there and, and you know, Titans were the Oilers for one, for example, you know, you, you see teams move around. So it's been quite there. Do you guys ever envision doing a little bit of a Rams or the Raiders and moving location or, or is Houston now going to be where you guys are set for life for as long as you're there? Uh, Houston's one of the great sports markets on the planet. Mm. We have 7 million people in this city. It's the most diverse city in America and nothing brings us together like the game of football. Monday to Saturday, everybody lives their lives as individuals. But on Sunday, we come together. We are one. We <laughs> are Texans. It's really special. I, I can't see us going in. It's got a great corporate base. Um, we have relatively little competition in that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's baseball, and there's basketball, and there's soccer. But, you know, 7 million people, I mean, that's, that's pretty special. Yeah, <laughs> that is true. And you might... And they love football. <laughs> I mean, I love football as well. So, you know, maybe the way after this conversation, you might have to talk about making me an unofficial fan of, uh, of the Texans. <laughs> uh, don't worry, I'll make you an official fan. Wait, if you make me an official fan, I'll make you an official Man United fan. Although I don't know if I hey. could do that. I don't know if the powers hey. in me I'm good, that. I'm good. I'm actually a Liverpool fan. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. From a kid. When I was a kid, mm. I, uh, I went over and trained with a guy by the name of Steve Highway, who played really? at Liverpool. Yeah. And Kenny Dalglish was playing there, and Bruce Gra Gravelar and uh, and Ian Rush and that whole crew, and got a chance to train at Melwood with them, and so I kind of fell in love with the club. How did you get into that? Uh, I, it was a representative team from the United States that that okay. Steve brought over, and uh, we trained for two weeks. Played at uh, oh gosh, what uh, the old Man City Stadium? Um, oh, and, before and it was the airline stadium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, yeah, it was really special. So you, obviously, I know you talked about Clemson and being a football player or soccer player in Clemson. You've got great, you know, you've had a great history in, in soccer. Have you never thought about maybe go, making that transition? You've run a successful football team, maybe running a successful soccer team, maybe owning your own soccer team? Could be. I don't know. I, I really just try to take it one day at a time. Okay. Uh, as long as I'm having fun, I'll keep doing what I'm doing. <laughs> as long as the people uh, that I work for and with, I love and they love me. It's all good. I, uh, I've made plenty of money. Um, just really <laughs> focusing on, on doing what's, what makes me happy right now. All right. No, that sounds, that sounds perfect. Well, you know, I think for me, it's been, it's been really fun having you on. It's really fun talking to you about football and talking about your book. Um, you know, I guess tell the, you know, sort of fans and our listeners, where can they find your book and, and sort of a little bit more um, information about that? Well, Daniel, it was great visiting with you. There is a website, uh, jamieroots.com. Mm -hmm. that has tools and blog posts and things of that nature. I'm really active on LinkedIn and Facebook. So if you want to become a friend on that, you'll, uh, you'll get information from me, just random thoughts and clarifications on things that are uh, contained within the book, things that are inspiring me. Um, and of course, the book is available at uh, amazon.com 
And in a couple of weeks, the audio book will come out. Mark Vandermeer, who's the voice of the Houston Texans, did the voiceover <laughs> for the book. And he that's dropped amazing. in game calls and all these Texans related things. So that's going to be fun. No, oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Guys, make sure you check it out. Make sure you, you know, you sort of read the book as well, because I think it's a great book. And even if you're not into sort of business or, you you know, I think it's a great book to help you motivate you and be the leader that, that individuals can be. So, you know, like I said, it's an international bestseller. It's one of the great, it's, it's a great read. Um, I definitely thoroughly enjoyed it. So it's been great. So Jamie, on that note, it's been, it's been a pleasure having you on is uh, hopefully we can get you on again a few times more, uh, talk about everything about football and, uh, and then sort of, Go from there but no it's appreciate thank you for for coming on and uh and yeah we'll uh good luck to the texans in the draft and uh and their head coach search and uh appreciate cheers it.